Brother, preach on. Well, it's good to be back with you this morning. You know, the last time I was here, it was raining hard. And today it rained hard. You're welcome. Uh, back here on what I like to call the heckler pew is where all my friends and relatives are sitting. And they reminded me this morning, uh, you don't have to preach long. And uh, they said, if I hold up a bulletin, that means shut it down. <laughs> that reminded me of uh, something that I was told when I was a kid. My grandfather was a deacon in the church, but he was a frustrated preacher. And every, he loved to preach, but they gave him very few opportunities. And when he did preach, he took advantage of it, and he would go a long time. And he wasn't very interesting to listen to. So my grandmother said one Sunday, now, Charles, when I pull out my hanky, that means it's time to quit. And on this particular Sunday, as they told the story, she pulled out her hanky, and he ignored it. So she began waving it just a little, you know, and he ignored it. Then she got it a little more flair. The hanky was all over the place. And at the end of the story, I envisioned my grandmother like one of those guys bringing in an airplane <coughs> like that. And finally, he, uh, she got his attention and shut it down. So if these people start standing up on a pew, you know uh, I've got to quit. We're in Philippians chapter 2. <laughs> Starting early, aren't they? <laughs> I don't know those people. Philippians chapter 3, I think I said 2. I want to uh, read uh, just uh, 14 verses or so here. Maybe, uh, yeah, 14 verses from the New American Standard Version. And you know why I use the New American Standard Version. It's the one Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. It's a good one. So is yours. Listen carefully, beginning with verse 1. Finally, my brethren... Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing, well, it's no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
This is a passage about knowing Christ, knowing Christ. And you would think that the Apostle Paul, who had been preaching Christ for over 20 years when he wrote these words, would know the Lord. And yet he says, I want to know Christ. What does he mean by that? Well, let's back up to verse 1 and work our way through very quickly and see if we can come to understand what it means to know Christ. He begins with the word, finally. And you already know that when a preacher says finally or in conclusion, it means absolutely nothing, does it? It doesn't mean that he's about to wind things up, but he says, basically, I'm finally getting to some important things that I wanted to talk to you about. And so he tells them that they need to rejoice in the Lord. In all circumstances, throughout Philippians, Paul is uh, advocating that we continue to rejoice in our relationship with the Lord, no matter what comes our way. And then he says, I can write the same things again. I've already told you about this. And so that means you can preach the same sermon again. If they didn't get it the first time or they need a reminder. And it's no trouble for me. It's a safeguard for you. And then he begins to say, beware. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. All of those descriptions apply to the same group of people. And he's re referring to some false teachers who may have come to the city of Philippi or at least they may be on their way. We call them today Judaizers. These are people who were raised in the Jewish religion. They are Jews. They were raised in Judaism, but they heard the gospel. They were baptized into Christ, but they didn't let go of everything having to do with the law of Moses. They held on to certain things like circumcision and certain feast days, and they were trying to bind those things on the Gentiles that were in Christ. These are false teachers. They were telling people, you can't be saved unless you keep certain aspects of the law of Moses. And so Paul's saying to the Philippians, you got to beware of these people. Beware of the dogs. Now that term dog is a term that the Jews use to describe the Gentiles, but Paul is turning that around and describing these false teachers, the Judaizers, with that word dog. This is not the kind of dog that Jesus was talking about in Mark chapter 7 when he said uh, that you can't take what belongs to the children and throw it to the dogs, and the dogs eat the crumbs from the table, that kind of dog. That's a, a pet, isn't it? That's a household. That's one of the family, isn't it? It's a little dog that jumps into your lap and licks your face and name is Fufu or something like that. This is the concept of a dog like Jim Croce sang about, the junkyard dog named Killer. These people are out to bite you. They're out to kill you spiritually. Beware of the evil workers, he says. These guys are not lazy. They're hard at work. But all that they accomplish is evil. It does not lead you to Christ. It leads you away from Christ. Beware of the false circumcision. They're advocating a physical circumcision as God required under the old law. It was a sign of the covenant. It was a sign that you were a Jew, and you couldn't be a Christian, these guys say, unless you were circumcised. Now, in the next verse, in verse 3, Paul says, you need to remember something. We are the true circumcision. He's talking about a spiritual kind of circumcision, a cutting away of the flesh of the heart, giving our heart totally to the Lord. We, he says, worship in the Spirit of God. And I think he has in mind what Jesus said in John chapter 4, that God is spirit, and we worship him in spirit and truth. In other words, in comparing, Jesus is comparing the Old Testament worship with what's coming in the New Covenant, his worship, and he's saying it's spiritual, and it's not like the Old Testament worship. In the Old Testament worship, you had to go to a temple, a specific city. 
you had to bring physical sacrifices. And that no longer will be the case. Our worship is the fruit of our lips in a, ra in a spiritual relationship with God. And not only that, he says, you remember that we glory in Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. Those guys, the Judaizers, they boast in the flesh what they've done in physical ways. We don't do that. We don't boast about our works because we recognize we cannot be saved by our works. The only boasting that we do is in Christ who died for us, who paid the price for our sins. We glory in nothing in the flesh. But in verse 4 he says, they want to glory, they want to boast, but if they want to boast, I could out-boast them. And now he's recalling his days in Judaism. You remember this man, Paul, whose name was Saul. What kind of man he was before he saw the Lord on that road to Damascus. He says, if they want to put confidence in the, in the flesh, boy, I can outdo them far more. Circumcised the eighth day. In other words, in keeping with the law, Paul, by his parents, was circumcised on exactly the eighth day as the law required. Of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, that's the kingly tribe. The first king, Saul, came from the tribe of Benjamin, a revered tribe, a Hebrew of Hebrews. That means my ancestry goes back all the way to Abraham. My folks were full-blood Hebrews. My, their folks were all the way back. Of the Jews, he was the Jewiest, I guess we could say. As to the law of Pharisee, they were the strictest sect of Judaism in keeping the law. As to zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. He tried to destroy the church. He wrote to the Galatian churches in Galatians 1, 13 and 14. As to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless, that is in the Pharisaic interpretation of law and tradition, there was nothing, no accusation that could be brought against Paul. That's the way he was. But in verse 7, there's that little word, but. But. In other words, that's what it was with me before I came into Christ. But. All of those things were gain to me, he said. But now I count all those things as loss for the sake of Christ. Paul is saying that the most important thing to him right now and forevermore is to know Christ. What does that mean, to know Christ? I'm going to hold my place here and go back to the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1. And let me just do a little reading here where this word know is used and might help us to understand what Paul is saying. Isaiah 1 beginning at verse 2. The prophet says, Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. And here's what God says. Sons I have reared and brought up. He's talking about the children of Israel. But they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner. And a donkey knows its master's manger, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. He's saying that his people do not fully have the kind of relationship with God that they ought to have. It's not even as strong a relationship as that of an ox with its owner. And then he begins to describe what's going on. Verse 4, alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from him. They're not living up to the standard of God, although they call upon him as their father and their God. If you drop down to verse 10, after the prophet talks about all of the punishment God is bringing upon them, 
He says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom, give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. He's not addressing the ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's using the, the, uh, those cities as metaphors for the children of Israel. They have become Sodom and Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? Wait a minute, Lord, didn't you order us? Didn't you command us to bring you sacrifices? But you've multiplied them. What is that to me? I have had enough of burnt offering of rams, the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Here's what's going on in Israel. They live like the devil through the week. And then they rush to the temple at the designated time and bring all of their sacrifices, but it means nothing to them. They're just going through the motions. They're just playing church. They're wearing out the carpet down at the temple, but all of it is uselessness. They think that God accepts that. They don't know God. They don't have a right relationship, intimate relationship with the Lord. Now Paul is using the word know here in Philippians 3 like that. He's saying, I want the closest personal relationship with Christ that a man can enjoy on this earth. I want to know Christ. There are three things he mentions here that he believes is important for him to come to know Christ. The first is this, I count all things as loss. And he's using bookkeeping terminology here. What I used to put down in the gain column I now consider to be in the loss column. In other words, everything that I thought was so important in my life, whatever it might be, position and prestige, he was more zealous for his ancestral traditions, he tells the Galatians, than his contemporaries. He was striving ambitiously to gain hold of Judaism and the things that it offered. All of that. All of that, he says, I now put in the loss column. It is no longer important to me. I think if you and I are really going to know Christ and to enjoy an intimate relationship with him, we've got to write everything that's important to us on this earth down in the loss column. It's just not that important. In view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. Have you got a nice house? I do. Just write that down in the lost column. It's just not that important. What if it burned to the ground? What if a hurricane, or not a hurricane, but a tornado, that's what you have out here, took it away? I wouldn't shed one tear. It's already can, you know, in the lost column. Have you got a nice car, or maybe two? When my son went to, off to college, he took my pickup with him. And I can remember that day, I waved by to my pickup. And I, you know, I really missed that pickup. Oh, well, I missed my son too, I guess. But I was moping around the house and about the loss of my pickup. My wife said, why don't you just go out and buy a used car that you can drive around town? So I did. I found a 1973 Chevrolet Corvette Stingray. <laughs> it's red. I still have it. It's a beautiful car. I've had a lot of fun with it. But I wrote that in the lost column a long time ago. It doesn't mean much to me. Everything that you think is so important in this world, 
write it down as a loss if you want to know Christ. Secondly, he says you count all of that as rubbish, garbage. And Paul uses a word here that's the worst kind of garbage you can imagine. It's what's flushed into the sewer. It's terrible. I used to live, I, I lived in uh, Durango, Colorado for 35 years, but before that, I lived in Clyde, Texas. It was a hot August day. I mowed the lawn, gathered grass clippings in two of those black plastic bags. I headed across the uh, church parking lot to a dumpster that we had in the alley. And I was going to throw the grass clippings in that. And I was 30 yards, I would say, from the dumpster when the stench, the odor from the dumpster hit me square in the face. It liked to knock me over. I couldn't believe how terrible that was. And I said, what am I going to do? I got these grass clippings. And so I said, I'm going to hold my breath and run over there and just throw them in. But so I did. I got a big breath and I ran over there and my curiosity got the best of me. I had to look inside. On one end, was a lot of food elements, you know, that were rotting. There was an old tomato that was shriveled up, bananas that were black, and lettuce that was brown. And remember this when you eat lunch today, and <laughs> you'll lose a few pounds. It was terrible. In the middle, there was a, somebody had thrown a tire, an old tire, into our dumpster, left the lid up, it rained, the rain water that it collected became stagnant it stunk and then on the other end well that's baby diapers can you imagine that that's where all the flies were down there on that end if you threw a hundred dollar bill in that dumpster i would not go in and get it i'd throw my son in after it but i wouldn't go get it <laughs> now can you imagine reaching over in that and pulling something out, taking it into your house, hanging it on the wall, or putting it on your mantle, and saying, invite your friends over and say, man, I'm proud of this. Did you see what I've done here? Paul said everything. All of the power, all of the wealth, all of the position, all of the prestige that you seek for in this life, it's nothing but garbage. And until you see that, you'll never come to know Christ intimately. And then thirdly, he says, I want to walk in his shoes. I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to fellowship his suffering. I want to be conformed to his death. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I think what, what Paul means is that Jesus arose from the dead never to die again. What could you do to, imitate, to intimidate Jesus? They threatened him. He said, yeah, you're going to kill me. Three days I'll be back. There's a power that we gain when we fully understand Jesus' power over life and death. When you fully believe that he will one day resurrect you to eternal life. Nobody will be able to intimidate you to compromise your faith. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to fellowship his suffering. That word is the koinonia word. I want to share in common what Jesus shared. Suffering for standing firm for the truth. Not giving in. I want to be conformed to his death. I don't think he means the cross or the method of death. 
But to die justified, to die innocently, to be willing to die for the cause in which you believe. That's Jesus, isn't it? I want to know that. So you walk in his shoes in order to know Christ Jesus. I'm not there yet, Paul says. But I keep, keep going. I go forward. I don't look back. I press on. Looking back can wear you down. There's so many mistakes back there, aren't there? Man, every once in a while you get to thinking about the things that you did, you're ashamed of, and it just sends a shiver up your back. But not only that, not only the, the wrongs that you did, you don't look back, but all of those moments of glory, all of the attainments that you achieved, you turn your back on those because none of that is important. You look forward. You press on to live and to know Christ Jesus. I want to know Christ. I want a close, intimate relationship with the Lord. One day I sat down and I thought about all of the people that I know, and I decided that I could divide them all into three different categories. One of them is what I call superficial relationships. And these are, are relationships where you know their name, but you might not even know if they're married or not. You certainly don't know when their birthday is or if they own a dog or anything like that. You talk to them about superficial things. How about those Denver Bronc uh, Dallas Cowboys? How about that? Huh? <laughs> things of that nature. I lived in Clyde, Texas for six and a half years, going to graduate school and preaching there in Clyde. Every morning I'd get up and go down to the only restaurant in town in Clyde, Texas, the Dairy Queen. And I got to know the, the manager, a woman by the name of uh, Robbie, and uh, she and I got along real well. And if she saw me coming in, into the parking lot, she would have my coffee poured on my table, and I'd spread out a Greek text or, or whatever I was working on for, for graduate school at the time and drink coffee for about 30 or 40 minutes before I went off to school. It was great. One morning... I didn't have enough money for the coffee. I said, Robbie, I, I don't have enough money. I'm 10 cents short. Don't worry about it, guy. I'll come down and hear you preach. I'll take it out in preaching. I said, Robbie, I don't have any 10 cent sermons. <laughs> she said, that's all right. I'll come hear you twice. <laughs> now, those, that's the kind of relationship that you want to keep superficial. I think the multitudes that followed Jesus had that kind of relationship with him, superficial. They didn't know him. Some of them thought highly of him. They wanted to make him king, but they didn't understand. He's not an earthly king in the sense which they thought. They followed him from place to place. Thousands of them did. But they did so because... Well, he could heal their sick. He put food in their stomachs, but they didn't know that. A second category of people I know is what I would call developing relationships. These are people I want to know, and so I try to be with them and experience things with them that they can come to know me and I can come to know them. And you know a lot more about these people because you want to know them. You want to know about their family. You want to know about the birthdays and, and what interests them and things of that nature. And so you spend time together. There was, a, there was a friend of mine. He was the dentist in Clyde, Texas, when I lived there. He liked to play golf, and he and I 
played golf every Friday. I set that up because I wanted to get to know him and hopefully trying to bring him to Christ. He came to me one day and he said, Guy, my son, Ben, is five years old and your son, Josh, is five. And I talked to the Little League and, and the Pee Wee League of the Little League organization begins at six years old. But if the dad is a coach, they'll let a five-year-old play. My son wants to play. He said, I don't know anything about baseball, but you do. If you'll be the coach, he said, I'll be your assistant. And I said, I'll do it. And so both of our sons got to play. Have you ever tried to coach five and six-year-olds? <laughs> I remember one game, Bill was coaching first base and I was coaching third base. And one of our little players actually hit the ball. It's pretty rare. And I noticed immediately that it went through the legs of the shortstop. I mean, he bent over and watched it and waved at it as it went through his legs. And I looked out in left field to see what the left fielder was going to, how quickly he would pick it up. He was laying flat on his back, looking at the clouds, <laughs> having a great time. I looked at the center fielder. Would he come over and pick up the ball? He was chasing a butterfly. And I looked over into the right field, and the right fielder is picking a bouquet of dandelions for his mom. And I'm saying, we might actually score. So I yelled over to Bill on first base, send him to second. And Bill said, go to second, go to second. And the kid said, okay, coach, what's second? That bag down there, go and get on that bag. And so the kid did. He ran to second base. Now, grandparents and parents are all yelling, go home, go home. And I'm yelling, go home, go home. And when the kid finally heard it, he did. He went from second base over the pitcher's mound <laughs> to home base. And he was very proud of himself. Well, Bill and I grew closer as we thought about that incident months and even years after it happened. When you experience something like that, it, it draws you closer, doesn't it? I think the apostles were in this kind of relationship, developing relationship. They didn't know Christ, but they wanted to. And so when he called to them, they followed. And they went with him everywhere that he went. But they didn't know. They argued about which one of them was the greatest in the kingdom. James and John wanted to sit on the right and left hand of the Lord. In a boat, they argued about the fact that they didn't bring any food and they'd already witnessed how many thousands Jesus had fed. When parents were trying to bring their little children to the Lord, it was the apostles trying to keep them back. They didn't understand Jesus. They didn't know him. The third category is the close, intimate relationship that I have with some people. I had it with my wife for 53 years until she died last year. My wife was my secretary wherever I went to preach. I used to brag that I'd chase my wife around the desk and she'd sit in my lap and people would go, hmm, my secretary was my wife. She knew me. She could answer the phone for me and know when she might volunteer me for something. Oh, yeah, he'll be glad to do that. And then she'd tell me what I would be glad to do. She would say, no, he wouldn't be interested in that. Or he doesn't have time to do that. And she could do that because she knew me. 
That's where Paul wants to be with Christ, close, intimate, knowing him, knowing him personally. In the 1950s, there was a man by the name of John Howard Griffin. He wanted to know what it was like to be a black man in this country. And so he found a way to darken his skin, and he climbed on a bus and drove, rode the bus through the South. And he found out immediately that it wasn't a pleasant thing to be a black man. Go to the back of the bus. You cannot drink at this water fountain. That's whites only. You want a, something to eat, you go to the back door of the cafe and we'll order, take your order through the screen door. And he wrote about his odyssey in a book entitled Black Like Me. And his life changed forever because he knew the black man and his relationship with them changed. In the 1980s, there was a young industrial de de designer by the name of Patricia Moore. She wanted to know what it was like to be an elderly person in this country in the 1980s. She found a way to dress herself and put on a wig and make up that and a cane and, and walked stooped over and made her look like a woman in her 80s. And she talked about going into a department store on one occasion as a woman in her 80s and getting no help whatsoever. But when she returned as a beautiful woman in her 20s, they just fell over themselves trying to help her. And she wrote about that in a book entitled Disguised. But her relationship with the elderly changed because she had walked in their shoes. She knew them. One day God wanted to know what it meant to exist in life as a human being. And so the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he experienced everything that you and I experienced. He walked in our shoes. He stood at the graveside and wept, thinking about a loved one that had died. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was without a place to rest his head. He experienced the greatest suffering and died the greatest death on a cross. He knows us. And the Hebrew writer says because he knows us, he can come to our aid. And he calls upon us and invites us to know him. Do you know Christ? When people see you in your job, when people see you at school, when people see you at the supermarket, when they see you drive, do they know that you have a relationship with Christ? Do you know him? This morning, if you're not in a right relationship with Christ, you can make the adjustments and begin this journey with the Apostle Paul to intimately know the Lord. We stand ready to assist anyone here this morning who wants to get right with God through Christ. You can come to the front as we stand and sing this song together, and we'll assist you in any way that we can.